Wow, it got so quiet. All right. Usually I have to say good morning and it kind of gets people's attention. So y'all are really, really focused in this morning. That's cool. All right. Well, it is great to have everybody gathering in worship this morning as we are here to celebrate our Savior, to worship him together, to hear from his word and to lift our voice to him in praise. And as you join us this morning, I want to invite you, if you are a visitor with us, there should be a, a visitor's card or connection card in the pew in front of you if you're in the room. If you'd fill one of those out, drop it in the offering box by one of the exits uh, on your way out at the end of the service. That would be helpful to us. But if you're joining us online or you're in the room and just like digital better than, you know, old school, there is a digital option. If you'll scan that QR code that's on the screen or if you're watching online, it'll be in the comments as well, a, a link you can go to our website and there there's a connection to our connection card you can fill that out there is an opportunity to give in support of the ministries of the church online also there's an opportunity for prayer now you can pray anytime this is an opportunity for you to share prayer requests with us or praises with us uh, we value that we have a group that meets every week and spends time in prayer and uh, not just that one point during the week but we meet weekly and then throughout the week that group spends time in prayer over our list of prayer requests lifting those before the lord on behalf of well all of us who submit so i want to encourage you help us with that and know that when you do submit a prayer request those those prayer requests are being shared and they are being prayed over on a regular basis so we welcome your participation in that of course we do love to hear the praises the the updates on how god has responded to those prayers or what god is doing so help us out with that as well and then make use of our right now media account if you haven't then we want you to have opportunity to, to do that so that's just some of what is going on in the life of the church with basic weekly stuff that's the same every week right this week there's some stuff that's not the same one of those things is that today we are having church business meeting. It's our regular October business meeting. Believe it or not, this is the third Sunday of October, 2022. Some year. They're, they're, they get all blurred together, don't they? The year is almost over. I will not tell you how many days it is till Christmas, but if you've got kids or grandkids, they can tell you. And it's not many. Um, but we are at our regular church business meeting. The deacons are going to present a three-tiered plan of action at that meeting tonight as well. And then uh, just a reminder for our revitalization team, we're meeting at 4 o'clock today in room 103 if you're on the revitalization team. And then we have Operation Christmas Child. And Operation Christmas Child, we do that every year. As a church, we have a goal this year of 125 boxes. You may be looking and thinking, Scott, there's not 125 boxes up here. No, that's because everyone already took, no, they didn't. Um, some of you have already gotten boxes, that's great. There are far more boxes than what you see. This is just what the kids brought in as a representative sample, if you will, of the boxes. If you need a box, grab a box after the service um, and you could do that. There's also online opportunities related to those box, boxes. And now we have a video on Operation Christmas Child and their shoe boxes if you're not acquainted with it. Three, two, one! And when those lids come off those boxes, you have never seen such pure joy. So many smiles. The children just become wild and crazy. It's indescribable. To watch that child open that box for the very first time and see the look on their faces, it's amazing that God used a simple shoebox to bring that much joy. This is amazing as you can see the children's faces, they are excited as they open up the gifts for the first time. What makes the gifts more than just gifts is the message that comes with the gift. This is the opportunity for a child to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. Thank you. We are very happy. God bless you. Yay! These people back behind us, they're giving their time, 
families have given boxes, the enthusiasm, the excitement, it's off the charts. And we're just so thankful for these volunteers. We couldn't do it without them. They are the heart of the ministry. And because of them, many children, like even me, accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. What children need more than anything is love, hope, and faith in God. Every shoebox gift is an opportunity to share your faith. We thank you for this ministry that is yours, that you use a shoebox gift to go around the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It starts with a simple shoebox gift, and from there, these gifts go around the world and are given to each child. It could be in a pickup truck, it could be the top of a bus, the roof of a taxi, camels and donkeys, canoes going up the river, whatever it takes to get these gifts into the hands of children. And that's only the beginning. After children receive the box, they get to go through a 12-lesson discipleship course. And these children, they're committing their lives to Christ. And they get to share their faith with other children. After a child completes the greatest journey, they graduate and receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. My name is Romina Alejandra. I really like to draw and cook. One day, I was drawing and I wanted some markers. And I asked my mother if she could buy them for me. She said no, because she didn't have the money. Today, we received gift boxes. When I opened the box and saw the markers, I was very excited. I learned about God through the box. Today, I prayed that Jesus come into my heart. I am very grateful to everyone, to God and to you all for bringing me this box. This box provides the opportunity to put a smile on a child's face, gets them to know more about Jesus Christ, and also be disciples so that they can be disciple makers in the world. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. We have seen churches being planted. We have seen people being transformed. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. This is incredible. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. One box can touch not just the child, but the whole family. So we need to keep packing those boxes and pray for the children that God will use this in a very special way. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. You can be part of that. The avenue is very simple and literally right in front of you. And you may say, but I don't get out. I, I can't really go shopping, that sort of thing. Um, you have a cell phone that you can access the internet from or a computer. Then you have the opportunity also to go online, to build a box online at SamaritansPurse.org, build online. So take advantage of those opportunities. They're there before you, and if God is laying it on your heart, is moving you to respond in that fashion, then I encourage you, be faithful to respond to the call of God on your life in this avenue. Follow him with that. Now, there is just a little bit more I want to share with you, not about Operation Christmas Child, but about... Um, well, about our service today. Uh, tonight, you know, we're having business meeting. Well, one of the things on the agenda for the business meeting is a recommendation that we allow some of our space on Sunday mornings to be utilized by a couple of other congregations in our area, sister churches of like faith and fellowship, to join and utilize space that we aren't currently utilizing. And this morning, we've got the privilege of having uh, Brother Blaze Polk and his wife, Lizette, with us as guest, he is pastor of Dove's Nest Ministry, um, and they've already had church this morning, and they decided to come have church with us too. So, um, 
you know, we're looking forward to that. And he's actually going to lead us in scripture reading in a little bit as part of our service. But uh, Blaze is pastor of one of those congregations. I want to give you opportunity to meet him and Lizette this morning as well. So we're blessed and honored to have them as part of it. And I'm, I'm glad to have a fellow pastor from our association here uh, for our service this morning. So welcome. Not to put you on the spot. We don't put all of our visitors on the spot like that. But, you know, we preachers, we like to torment each other. So, all right. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer this morning as we worship him. Join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, this morning as we gather in this place, Lord, we desire to come before you in worship. Lord, we desire to come bringing who we are and what we have as an offering unto you, asking that you would take us and use us for your kingdom. Use us in a mighty way. Father, we confess to you that we have been distracted, that it is so easy to have our attention pulled away from you. But Father, we seek, we seek to worship you. We seek to be forgiven for our unfaithfulness in the past and to experience that joy anew of right relationship with you, of fellowship with you, of worship of you. And so, Lord, as we gather to worship this morning, we lift our hearts and our voices to you, asking that you would lead us in this time, but not just this time, in each hour of this week that we go out from this place by the power of your Spirit, that we go out and we impact lives for your kingdom, sharing your gospel and your love with this world around us that so desperately needs it. Lord, help us to truly worship you in this time. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, congregation, let's stand and join together singing all creatures of our God and King. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam, oh praise him, oh praise him, Alleluia, Alleluia. so strong, he clouds that sail in heaven along, oh praise him, alleluia, oh morning praise rejoice, ye lights of evening find a joy, oh praise him, oh praise him, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. tender heart forgiving others take your part oh sing ye alleluia ye who long pain and sorrow bear praise God and on him cast your care oh praise him oh praise him alleluia alleluia Alleluia. Let all things their Creator bless and worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise. 
praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. weeks ago we learned a new song of Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. So I'm counting on you to remember it. It's only been a couple of weeks now. Right? Let's sing it together. Pray Psalm 150. the starry host, you trace the mountain peaks, you paint the evening skies with wonders. The earth, it is your throne, from desert to the sea, all nature testifies your splendor. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, sing his greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord, raise your voice, you heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. into the dust with love your spirit breathe you formed us in your very likeness to know your wondrous works to tell your mighty deeds to join the everlasting chorus praise the lord praise the lord Sing his greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord. Raise your voice, you heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Let symphonies resound, let drums and choirs ring out, all heaven hear the sound of worship. Let every nation bring its honors to the King, a roar of harmonies eternal. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Sing his greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord. Raise your voice, you heights and all you depths. From furthest east to west, you distant burning stars. All creatures near and far, from sky to sea to shore, sing out forever. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Thank you. You can be seated. Our responsive reading is taken from the 23rd division of Psalms. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake.
Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup run it over. May the Lord lend a blessing to the readers, to the hearers, but most of all, to the doers of his holy word.
peace and rest of God. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. We'll sing a song now that I'm sure you've maybe sung before. Uh, I'm sure you've sung before, but it's been a while. So it'll seem like I'll do a song for you. This is a call and response song. So I'll sing the first part, and you'll see the words appear in yellow. That's your response on that. And so we'll sing now, You're Worthy of My Praise. <laughs>
Thank you, Jim. Sweet hour of prayer. Today we're going to be looking at prayer. But when I say the word prayer, what comes to mind for you? Now, it seems like a loaded question, doesn't it? Some of you, that's time alone in a closet of prayer. For others, you, your first thought may have been the prayer that you will utter before diving into lunch. Some of you, it's life. It is a connection to the Savior that you cling to. Some of you honestly might be questioning, what's the point? Because sometimes it feels like talking to the ceiling. Today we're going to look at the idea of prayer as Jesus talked about prayer to his disciples. In the 11th chapter of Luke, the disciples came to Jesus and, well, well, let's just read it. It says, one day Jesus was preparing, or excuse me, was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. You know, John taught not just prayer, but John taught his disciples stuff. You're living examples of stuff in front of us, but we want you to teach us some stuff. Teach us how to pray. And so Jesus begins to teach them about prayer. Now there's a few myths about prayer that I want to clear up before we get into the text. One of those myths is that prayer is this elaborate, difficult thing. It's not. We may make it difficult. We may listen to people who are um, maybe what we would consider gifted public prayers. I mean, they are so eloquent. They get up and they speak and, and their prayers are just beautiful. And we may in our hearts sit there and think, I can't pray like that. That's how you're supposed to pray? I can't sound like that. You don't have to. Because you're not them. And if they are praying from their heart and that's what it sounds like, good. But what God wants to hear is your heart calling out to Him. Prayer is communication between you and God. When I present the plan of salvation as part of the service every week, you'll hear me say, there, you know, Talk to God. And I say we have this fancy church word for it. We call it prayer. Because that's what it is. It is a conversation with God. And you may say, well, it's kind of a one-sided conversation. It's not supposed to be. Yeah, you do some of the talking. But you're also supposed to spend part of that time listening to. Communication is important. Think about any important relationship in your life. Maybe you've got a close friend, maybe a spouse, maybe uh, co-workers or employees or whatever in your life. What sort of a relationship do you have with them if you never talk to each other? This is going to be a very good one. Those of you that have had businesses, if you've got employees and you never say anything to your employee and your employee never says anything to you, are things going to go well? No, you, you hand them a note that says you're hired, and then you hand them a manual of stuff they're supposed to do, and then you just figure it's done? No, he wouldn't do that. By the way, God didn't do that to us either. He didn't just redeem us from our sin and hand us a manual and say, I'm done. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through his spirit. He speaks to us through his spirit, speaking through those that know him, the community of faith. He speaks to us, but we also have to speak to him. We need to pray. Maybe we feel inadequate to the task. Maybe we feel like it's just not there. Hear what he teaches the disciples when they ask him, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. 
And he said to them, starting in verse 2, when you pray, say, and this is going to read a little bit different probably than what you're used to. This is the New International Version, and they've kind of pared down. There's a lot of stuff this prayer has picked up over the years through copied manuscripts and whatnot, but paring it down to what we know reasonably well was, was the core of it. Here it is. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. When the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray, this is what he gave them. Now, not that they would memorize that and just use that as a prayer. It is a model of prayer. It is, this is the framework. This is how you should pray. What do we see in there? And I could spend a whole sermon on this. I'm not going to. There's more we want to cover. Start out, who are you talking to? You're talking to your heavenly Father. Father, hallowed be thy name. What's that mean? I remember a story about a kid that um, in Sunday school they were talking about God and they were like, who is God? What is God's name? And he said, well, it's Howard. They're like, what do you mean, Howard? Where are you getting Howard? No, God's name's Howard. It's in the Bible. What? So yeah, it's in the Bible. Our Father who art in heaven, Howard be thy name. It's like, Hallowed, what does it mean? It means holy. Holy is the name of God. The name of God is something reverent. It is something other than us. It is not part of creation, but it is over all of creation. Father, hallowed be your name. You have the authority. You are holy. What's the next line? Your kingdom come. What does that mean? What is it like in his kingdom? He is king. And everything is ordered by his will and his command. It is praying, Lord, may it be here like it is in your presence. He goes on, give us each day our daily bread. Rely on God for what you need and what you have. Trust in him for it. And then what I think is one of the most challenging parts of it, forgive us our sins. We like that part. That's an easy part. God, forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. You know, essentially what he's telling them to do is to pray, God, forgive me the way I forgive other people. Do you really, if we're honest, do you really want God to forgive you the way you forgive other people? I think if we're honest about it, most of us would be saying, does 80% of the time count? See, this is a reminder of who we should be in relationship to God. If we want God's kingdom to come, if we want to declare his name holy and declare he is our father and to trust in him each day for our daily bread and to trust in him for the forgiveness of our sins, we're going to have to be obedient to him. And part of obeying him, part of experiencing his love, his grace, his forgiveness is to share that with others. And it's not just telling them about it, but it's understanding, no, the people in your life don't deserve to be forgiven. Neither do we. But God loves you and He loves them and He calls you to forgive. Forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. God, keep me away from temptation. There's almost an assumed there. If I face temptation, then there's going to be problems. 
there's the assumption there that if I face temptation, I'm much more likely to succumb to temptation, aren't I? But instead, God, lead me away from that. Scripture reminds us to flee from temptation. Here, asking God's help. So, Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Now, that's enough to chew on right there, but Jesus didn't stop. He gave them an example of a prayer. Then he starts to really teach them about prayer. And the reason I want to share the rest of this is, well, it's God's word, but also it should challenge us and encourage us as believers, as followers of Christ, as the redeemed, to understand that our conversation with God has a context. To understand that the way we talk to God and listen to God is important. He's not just some universal clockmaker that's out there, set everything in motion, and doesn't really care. Instead, he is intimately involved in our lives, and he cares deeply for each and every one of his creation. Verse 5, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and, well, I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, or he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now, the context there, this guy's your friend. You've got unexpected house guests. They've showed up late. You know, back in those days, the roads weren't that great. You'd set out traveling, and maybe there were issues along the way, and, and you needed to get to a place that was safe to spend the night. Out in the open wasn't necessarily a great place to spend the night on the roadways. And, well, so your friend shows up. And, yeah, he didn't call ahead because, you know, it's the first century world and there are no phones, okay? So this guy just shows up. You've got to feed them. They're your guest. They need help. So hospitality dictates you're going to provide them a place to stay. You're going to provide them with food. Lo and behold, you haven't been down to the local Kroger yet or H-E-B, or Walmart, or wherever you go, and you don't have enough bread for the sandwiches. What do you do? Hey, Bob next door. He borrowed my chainsaw last week. I'm going to see if I can borrow some bread. And so you go over to Bob's house until Bob answers the door. Bob yells at you out the open window because no air conditioning. And says, leave me alone. It's late. I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. Go away. Hey, but I'm your friend from next door. I need three loaves of bread. Seriously, go away. I mean, you, you know the interaction. Can you imagine doing that to someone? Imposing on a friend in that fashion? Well, you're in need. And your need isn't just about you. Your need is about you caring for others that are in need. And so you're not really just asking for bread from them. You're asking them to participate in meeting a need. And Jesus says, you do that. And your friend is going to think, our friendship doesn't go that far. He's not going to give you the bread because you're friends. But instead, and I love the way that Luke describes this. He says, I tell you in verse 8, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, 
He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. I can't believe this guy. Yeah, I'll get him some bread. I'm awake anyway. And you may be thinking, wait, Jesus is talking about prayer and he's saying this is how we should approach it? Yeah. How often do we go to God with shameless audacity asking for the things of his kingdom? And how often do we hold back from asking God because, well, because we rationalize our way out of it? Oh, I can't ask God for that. Oh, God already would have done it if he were going to do that. Oh, I don't know. That seems like something too big to ask. Or, I'm not worthy to ask. Shameless audacity. Now, don't listen to that account and go, yeah, God's the friend that doesn't want to get out of bed. No, that's not the point. The point is, our approaching God in prayer, what our attitude should be like. We should be persistent. We should have that shameless audacity to go before God. Well, he goes on in verse 9. He says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek. And you will find, knock, and the door will be open to you. Now there's a passage for you. And it has roots. As we look at that passage and we hear this this seek and you will find, back in the book of Joshua it talks about seeking after the Lord and he will be found. If we seek after the things of God, he doesn't play hide and seek with them. He puts them there to find. But we have to look. Because if we have no interest in seeing the things of God, the things of his kingdom, we won't. But we have to seek after him. We have to knock on that door. We have to, with shameless audacity, Knock on that door and ask the Lord. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks on the door, it will be opened. He goes on and he tells one more story starting in verse 11. He says, and I think this is a powerfully important few verses here because they describe our relationship with God and they describe God's relationship with us if you know God as your Savior and Lord if you have trusted in Christ for salvation and the forgiveness of your sins then in God's eyes you are his child in fact scripture describes that relationship with him as saying you have gained the right to be called the child of God A co-heir with Christ. That's the relationship now between you and the Father through Christ. Jesus teaching his disciples in verse 11 of chapter 11 of Luke says, Which of you fathers, so we're going to talk to the dads in the room, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Let me make this clear if it's not. If your child is asking you for a fish, and this would be for food, and instead you hand him a snake, it's not funny. It's not clever and it's not kind. It is a cruel thing to do. In fact, it's a dangerous thing to do. And that's Jesus' point. What earthly father that loves their child when their child asks for something is going to hand them something dangerous instead. Verse 12, or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. Yeah, the old scorpion for an egg gag. No, we wouldn't do that to our kids. Why? Because we love them. Because we want to provide for them and care for them. Not place them in harm's way. In fact, we go out of our way to keep them out of harm's way. 
We can all relate to that, hopefully. If he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, if we in our humanity, in our broken, fallen state, redeemed, forgiven, made righteous by the blood of Christ, but not righteous on our own, if we can get that much of it right, if we can express our love in that fashion, by not giving something harmful, but giving something helpful, he says, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And there it is. If in our imperfect love and our imperfect relationships, we can give good gifts motivated by love, then how much more, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good gifts to us? How much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. I say, Scott, you just interchanged gifts and Holy Spirit. Yes, I did. All too often we're praying for the wrong things. All too often we pray for the end result, not the power to see God's kingdom move. God promises us His Holy Spirit, His Comforter, His Counselor, His sustaining presence, His empowering presence in our lives as we seek to live for His kingdom, as we seek to serve Him, as we seek to proclaim Him to a world that needs the message of the Gospel and the love of Christ. And all too often we pull up short of asking. You may say, but Scott, there's been stuff I've prayed for and I didn't see it happen. There's been stuff that I thought this is a good thing. There's no way God's not going to give me this. And He doesn't. He doesn't do the thing or He doesn't give the thing. I don't get it. You don't have to. And sometimes it's hard not to get what we've prayed so diligently for. What we've asked for, and we say, how can a loving God not answer this prayer? And it's just our vision is that short, and His is that long. Because sometimes the prayer is not yet, or the answer to the prayer is not yet. And sometimes the answer to the prayer is no, because you think that's what you need, and you think that's the best thing, but I see more than you do. So no. You think, but I don't get it. Think back to your growing up years when you asked your parents for something and you thought this is a great idea. You thought this is a wonderful thing. This would be a blessing in my life. And your parents go, no, that's not a good idea. That's really not a good idea. Can I just say that when I was a kid, there used to be these specials on TV that I loved to watch. All of us at school would talk about them. A fellow by the name of Evil Knievel. Can you imagine the sort of things we asked our parents for? Okay, I need a motorcycle, a ramp, 15 cars, and something that burns. And we're thinking, this is a great thing. And our parents, thankfully, are saying, And they're going, yeah, I don't think so. This would not be a good thing for you. Now, that's a ludicrous example, but it's an example, hopefully, that helps you understand sometimes God, not sometimes, all the time, God sees more than we do. He knows more than we do. He knows what's coming down the road that we have no clue about. And so when we pray thinking he's got to answer this, he doesn't. He doesn't have to answer it the way you want it answered. But every time you pray to God and say, God, give me your spirit. Give me more of you. 
That there might be less of me in what people see. Give me your vision for those around me. Help me to see this city the way you see this city. Help me to make wise choices instead of the foolish ones I am so prone to make on my own. God will answer. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What is our relationship with God? Through Christ, he is a father that loves us. Loves us as his dear children. That's the relationship. Now, what sort of a relationship is it for a father that loves his children dearly and his children don't talk to him? Makes the dad feel pretty lousy, doesn't it? It hurts his heart. And what's it do for the kids? Nothing. Nothing good. It makes them feel isolated. It makes them feel alone. It makes them feel separated. But God is always right there. If you feel separated, alone, isolated from God, then it's time to turn back to Him. We're going to have a time of decision in just a moment, a hymn of commitment. And I'm going to invite you, if you need to spend time in prayer before God, whether it's about stuff in your own life, whether you're praying for friends, whether you just want to pour out your heart and thanks to him, whether you want to come spend time praying for this church, her ministries and what we're going through right now, I want to encourage you, take time during this song of commitment, come down and pray. Use the front of this church as an altar before God to pray. Quit isolating yourself from a father that loves you dearly and wants to talk to you and wants you to talk to him. He loves you. Now, you may be saying, okay, you're talking about talking to God. You're talking about turning back to him. I don't have a relationship with God. I've never turned to him. That may be where you're at. But if you get that sense in your heart today that you need that relationship with God to be right, understand he's inviting you to come to him. He's invited all of us to turn to him, to be made right with him. You see, in the beginning, God created us for relationship with him. And we broke the relationship. Started with Adam and Eve, but all of humanity has sinned and turned against God. All of us have fallen short of God's holiness and of a right relationship with him. And the price of that turning against God, the price of that rebellion is death. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Now, we can pay that price and there's nothing left. It'll cost us everything and an eternity in hell. But we can pay the price for that sin. But God's invitation to you is that he loves you and you don't have to pay that price. Because God came and he lived among us in the flesh, showing us who he was in the person and work of Jesus the Christ. And then he willingly gave himself up to die as a sinless sacrifice to pay the price for all sin. For mine, for yours, for the sins of the world. Why? So that we would no longer have that death penalty on our heads. Because he paid it for us. You may say, then it is, is everybody right with God? No, because we have to turn to him and accept that offer of him paying the price on our behalf to accept his forgiveness for our sin and so i ask if you're sensing i need that right relationship with god have you turned to him and so i'm not sure how to do that haha -ha. pray talk to god and in that prayer i want to encourage you to cover three basic areas first admit to god that you're a sinner you know you are, he knows you are, but get it out there. Admit to God that you're a sinner. Second, ask him to forgive you, believing that he can and does, because he says so in his word. 
So admit your need, trust in Him for forgiveness. And then lastly, confess Him as Savior and Lord. And part of that means commit to live your life with Him as the boss instead of you being the boss. Live with Him as God in your life. Turn from how you were living to how He is calling you to live. Live out that new relationship with Him as one who is forgiven for all of your sin, past, present, and future, and who is loved by God, called a dearly loved child of God. You need to take that step today. If you do, I encourage you. Spend the time in prayer. Again, we're going to have this song of commitment. Use that time to turn to God in prayer and admit your sin to Him, asking Him to forgive you and committing yourself to live for Him. Then I want to invite you, if you make that decision, if you're in the room with us, come down to the front. I'll be down here. I'll gladly meet you down here. I want to talk with you a little bit. I want to pray together about what God is doing in your life today because it is a great thing. If you're joining us online, reach out to us. Let us know about that decision. We want to walk with you in that process. If you're not in the area, but you've got friends, family, or coworkers that know Christ and live for Him, that are plugged into a church family, then I invite you, tell them what is going on in your life. Tell them what God is doing and the commitment that you have made. And begin to grow alongside them. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer in this time. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we do worship You. And we rejoice in Your redeeming work. We thank You that You have included us in it as both recipients and as witnesses of what you are doing. Now, Father, we lift up those that you are touching the hearts of. And Lord, as they respond to you, as they turn to you, being forgiven for their sins and beginning this new life in you, Father, we pray that you would surround them with brothers and sisters in Christ that can walk with them and encourage them in this journey as they grow in you. Father, guard their lives as need be, that they may grow and that they may be bold witnesses for you. Use them in your kingdom and give them the blessing of knowing and following you. Lord, lead them to the place where you would have them to be, to serve you. Lord, for us as a congregation, Lord, take us and use us. Lead us to where we need to be. Show us what you have for us and what you are calling us to, that we may glorify you and you alone. Lord, we lift up Dove's Nest and Brother Polk, asking your continued blessing on that congregation as well the sister church, as they seek to proclaim you and serve in your kingdom as you have called us all to. Lord, we rejoice in what you are doing in their church. Father, it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. 
Again, thank you all for joining us this morning as we gathered for worship. Now let's go out of this place to worship, to worship God in every aspect of our lives, whether it's work or recreation or just life in general. Glorify God with it. Proclaim him to those around you. Make him known and stay in that conversation of prayer with him. Go in the name and in the power of Jesus the Christ and glorify the Father. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, sing His greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord, praise your voice, you heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west, let everything that has 